Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you for the introduction, Flora, and thank you all for coming to this lecture. Um, I also would like to thank my host, uh, Julie Amillon at UMIR uh, Heritage. And so I'll just jump straight ahead. The title of my project is uh, The New European Cinema of Precarity. Um, the overall aims of the project are to analyze the poetics and politics of the new European cinema of precarity, to situate the cinema historically by drawing out the similarities and differences between these films and earlier um, films dealing with uh, similar themes, to find out whether this cinema associates precarity with a particular social class or represents it as an experience that cuts across classes, and to explore where the cinema locates the possibility for social and political change. Um, these are the overall uh, aims of the entire project, not necessarily of the present of the presentation. So the structure of the lecture is uh, going to be, uh, as you can see here, I will start with some definitions of uh, neoliberalism, possible paths of resistance to neoliberalism. I'll talk a little bit about feminism and neoliberalism, the notion of work, class and precarity uh, and the precariat before saying a few words about the new European cinema of precarity in general some historical precursors to the cinema and ending with a um, specific analysis of a series of French films. I've, I've chosen to talk about French films just for the purposes of this presentation, just because I cannot cover all of European cinema. I had to I know, limit my, um, my sample of films. So starting with some definitions, of course, neoliberalism is very difficult to define. There have been hundreds of books written on it and I cannot really do them all justice. But I'll just start with the one general definition. Neoliberalism is a political epistemological program or political philosophy, if you want, rather than simply free market fundamentalism. And here I'm drawing on the work of Wendy Brown, William Davis, Philip Mirovsky. Uh, of course, there are many others, but I've chosen to focus on these. And some of the core ideas of neoliberalism are free markets do not occur naturally. They must be actively constructed through political organization. The political goal of neoliberals is not to destroy the state, but to take control of it and to redefine its structure to make it uh, um, um, in order to create a market friendly culture. The most important virtue under neoliberalism, more important even than justice, is freedom, most importantly defined as the freedom of corporations to act as they please. Um, uh, Various scholars have tried to uh, historicize neoliberalism. So I'm here, I'm drawing on the work of William Davis who distinguishes between three main phases in the historical development of neoliberalism, combative neoliberalism uh, during this initial stage, which is associated with the spread of neoliberalism. Uh, the ideological orientation of the phase is uh, very important. And according to William Davis, ideologically speaking, the purpose of neoliberalism was to demolish non-capitalist avenues of political hope. In other words, it emerged primarily as a response or a reaction to the resurgence of socialism and communism. In the second stage of uh, uh, neoliberalism, normative neoliberalism, as Davis calls it, the neoliberal telos becomes a constructivist one of rendering market-based metrics and instruments the measure of all human worth, not only inside the market, but also crucially outside the market. And the last stage, punitive neoliberalism, from the, basically the global financial crisis in 2008 to the present, uh, and according to Davis, in contrast to the offensive in the first uh, stage of neoliberalism against socialism, the enemies in this last stage at, that are targeted now are largely disempowered and internal to the system itself. And in some instances, they have already been destroyed as an autonomous political force. And yet that increases the urge to punish them further, which is why Davis calls it the punitive neoliberalism. Um, what is the current state of neoliberalism? According to some critics, uh, neoliberalism has already died. Um, and they point to several historical moments in this uh, development to, um, you know, to prove or to demonstrate the death of neoliberalism. Then there is the interregnum perspective, according to which neoliberalism is kind of in between uh, um, being dead and alive. Here I'm referring to Colin Crouch's book, uh, The Strange Non-Death of Neoliberalism, uh, or Simon Springer's uh, notion of neoliberalism as living dead. And finally, the mutation perspective, according to which neoliberalism doesn't die, it just mutates and lives on. And more recently, it has become um, connected to far-right forces and mutate it into um, new illiberalism. Um, then there are various critiques of neoliberalism. Um, uh, Carolyn Hardin uh, very helpfully divides them into three groups, Foucauldians, Marxists, and Apocalysts. Uh, 
Um, for Guardians, he'll just focus on Wendy Brown and Maurizio Lazzarato and Marxist David Harvey and Apocalypse. Uh, here, I'm not really going to talk about them, but these are, bas these are basically scholars that used uh, the term neoliberalism very loosely to talk about various um, economic, political, and uh, cultural phenomena such as globalization, financialization, deregulation, and so on. So I don't really find this uh, use of the term very helpful because it's um, not narrow enough. Uh, so here I'm going to talk about the Foucauldians and Marxists, um, drawing again on the work of Wendy Brown mostly. According to her, neoliberalism is a political rationality or political philosophy that extends and disseminates market values to all institutions and social action. And in contrast with the notorious laissez-faire of classical economic liberalism, neoliberalism does not conceive of the market itself um, or of rational economic behavior as purely natural. Both are constructed and organized by law and political institutions and therefore require political intervention, which does not mean that the market is controlled by the state, but actually the opposite. The state is controlled by the market. And finally, the extension of economic rationality to formerly non-economic domains and institutions, which is individual conduct. New liberalism normatively constructs and interpolates individuals as rational calculating creatures whose moral autonomy is measured by their capacity for self-care and configures morality as a matter of rational deliberation about costs, benefits, and consequences. This will be very important later on in my discussion of uh, the specific films that I've chosen. According to the Marxist critique of neoliberalism, neoliberalism is not really a new economic theory or even an organization of world power, but rather a variant of an old concept. It is the current version of the dominant ideology that serves the class in power. Um, and for neoliberals, the political distinction of significance this is also important, is not right versus left or communism versus fascism, but instead totalitarianism versus liberalism, or more generally speaking, collectivism versus individualism. This will also come into play later on in my discussion of uh, films. Uh, in addition to economic, um, sorry, histories of neoliberalism, there have been a bunch of um, social and cultural histories of neoliberalism. Here I will cite only a few, Botansky and Chappelle's most um, uh, kind of famous one, The New Spirit of Capitalism, in which they show that uh, starting from the mid 70s uh, onwards, capitalism abandoned the hierarchical forest work structure and developed a new network based form of organization founded on employee initiative and freedom and autonomy in the workplace. And then uh, authors like Phoebe Moore and Deborah Lupton uh, have analyzed the political and social dimensions of self tracking, uh, self management. Um, and Phoebe Moore specifically demonstrates that the push to render the automatic self self monitoring, self tracking, self surveying all the time leads to increased rates of subjective and objective precarity. And there's also David Hancock who has written interestingly about um, new conservatism in relationship to Bohemia and analyzing the ways in which aspects of Bohemia have been incorporated in the construction of neoliberalism's moral economy through the celebration of the heroic entrepreneur uh, and the celebration of uh, risk. But uh, ultimately Hancock argues neoliberalism's gift, this emphasize, emphasis on risk and autonomy comes at a price. Uh, the edge existence is coupled with removal of social safety nets and increasing insecurity and precarization. Um, scholars have uh, also discussed various ways of resisting neoliberalism. Uh, here I'm drawing on the work of Dimitri Surias and Mark Fisher. To resist neoliberalism is to oppose all of these things that I've listed here from positivism, quantification, utilitarianism, all the way to creativity, happiness, self-improvement. Um, also another way to think about possible resistances to neoliberalism is to ask ourselves, what does neoliberalism not understand? It does not understand egalitarianism. It does not understand anti-authority and ethic, silence or refusal. And I'll come back to this notion of silence and refusal later on. Uh, resisting neoliberalism is predicated on making visible factual orderings of neoliberal rationalities, in other words, demonstrating that neoliberalism is not natural, uh, but is value laden and not neutral. And this is also the um, assumption behind Mark, Fisher, Mark Fisher's book, Capitalist Realism, where he also argues that capitalist realism or this idea that there is no other reality other than capitalist reality can only be threatened if it is shown to be in some way inconsistent, untenable, and not natural, but merely contingent. In other words, if it's shown that it's not natural, but contingent, that means that it can be changed. Uh, resisting this neoliberalism, um, here I'm drawing on the work of Peter Fleming, who has discussed various revolts, including the Occupy movement, that he found striking because of the silence of those involved in those revolts. When they were asked to communicate you know, their program, their agenda, what they want, no representative or leader emerged to speak, no charter was delivered, 
Only a taciturn withdrawal from the machinery of dialogue was evident, uh, says Fleming. So he's interested in exploring further this notion of silence as refusal. And he argues that silence here does not signify an inability to communicate, but rather a choice not to talk to power, a refusal to be recognized by power, to enter into the discursive mirror game that is now governing so much liberal discourse. Uh, moving on to how the, our notions, our understanding of class and work have changed under new liberalism. Again, drawing on the work of Peter Fleming. Fleming argues that work has assumed a gaseous form and uh, rendering obsolete traditional divisions like work time, free time, public, private, fixed variable, capital, and um, the various processes of financialization, deregulation, privatization have led to the uberization of precarious non-subjects. And interestingly, he identifies desertion, death, sleep, and illness as potential sites of ideological refusal of the new liberal work mythology, i.e. the intersecting trends toward flexibilization, individualization, casualization, managerialism. And uh, there is a silver lining to these developments. He argues that unlike preceding eras of uh, capitalism, labor's lament, as he calls it, is today just as likely to be heard about among perversely salaried bankers as it is with lowly called center workers. And this shifts the nature of its power and therefore the coordinates of its social refusal, because what it means is that historical conflict is no longer opposed, um, the, there's no longer opposed to massive molar heaps to very clearly defined classes, the exploited and the exploiters, the dominant and the dominated, uh, as it is with Marx, uh, among which in every individual case, one could differentiate. Rather, the front line now cuts no longer in the middle of society between different classes, but rather in the middle of each of us. Uh, Maurizio Ferraris uh, also kind of has criticized uh, the typical uh, Marx, Marxist tradition of uh, talking about work, um, arguing that um, the Marxist tradition is partial, he says, to reading labor in terms of toil and alienation. But instead, what he thinks we're witnessing nowadays is not the disappearance of, uh, disappearing of work, but rather the dissemination of work, a shift in the places and relationships of work, and the transformation of work into activities, or what the term he uses is mobilization. So he makes this distinction between traditional notions of work you know, something that is fixed, repetitive, uh, organized uh, versus mobilization, this uh, more kind of diffuse notion of work, uh, former activities that were, we would never have thought of in terms of work that are nowadays actually work. And here it's uh, helpful to also refer to Guy Standing's um, um, division of different types of work that are not labor into uh, subcategories such as care work, reproductive work, waiting for labor, wait, work for labor, work for debt. So some of these activities that before were not considered work uh, such as, you know, uh, preparing cover letters for future jobs, uh, maintaining employability, that is actually work. Uh, but under Marx, that would not be considered work. That's just one example. Uh, just as with the notion of work, um, class has also been um, uh, rethought uh, recently. The image of the working class has undergone dramatic changes as a result of the deindustrialization of the West. Uh, instead of the old uh, familiar image of the blue collar manual male worker, the coal miner, the auto worker, for example, has been replaced by one that is feminized and white collar, the call center employee, the shop assistant. And while in Marx, the working class is a well-defined entity, scholars now are increasingly calling into question such essentialist definitions of class, mainly drawing on the work of the uh, French sociologist Pierre Bordeaux. And here I have a quote from Bordeaux. He argues that the classification of people can never be contained within objective systems of measurement, but it's always the outcome of struggles over and against these very systems of measurement. In other words, class is a relational concept and social classes emerge only through struggles against exploitation and inequality. In other words, uh, a working class does not kind of pre-exist the people that we put in those categories, but is the very object of uh, class struggle. Um, any critical conversation about contemporary labor cannot afford to ignore the crucial role women's work assumes in a new liberal regime of power which increasingly derives its profits from the kinds of skills often associated with femininity, such as flexibility and adaptability. And more recently, the financial crisis, austerity, the migration crisis and unemployment have uh, led feminists to rethink Marxist infected feminist approaches to labor. And feminist scholars have argued that the independence of feminism sought for women was appropriated in the growth of contract labor and eventually the gig economy. Uh, here I'm just going to mention just one work. There are many, many works on the relationship between feminism and neoliberalism. Uh, Diane Negra and Yvonne Tasker's edited collection, Gendering the Recession, 
And even though uh, this uh, collection is devoted mostly to Hollywood films or American cinema in general, many of their observations are equally valid for European cinema, as we will see later on. So in their work, uh, Gender in the Recession, they explore the privatization of the recession in recent uh, American genre films to critique post-feminist culture's tendency to hold individual women rather than structures of gender hierarchy responsible for gender inequality and injustice. And they argue that in an era in which accounts of economic decline frequently privilege male subjectivity through uh, such buzzwords as man session and invitations to man up, they draw attention to the renewal of long established tropes of masculinity in crisis and the discursive trope of failing males and coping females, which we will see is also typical of European films, which predates the recession. And specifically focusing on the recessionary chick flick, uh, films like Julie and Julia, Eat, Pray, Love, and many others, uh, and comparing those with corporate male melodramas like The Company Man and Up in the Air and others, they conclude that the recessionary chick flick broadly downplays the significance and consequences of female unemployment and oftentimes sketching female work struggles as significant only in as much as they correlate with romantic problems, relationship problems, versus the corporate male melodrama, which presents male redundancy, male unemployment in very dramatic terms, both as a tragic scenario and also as an opportunity for personal reinvention. And we'll see this is also the case in European films. So some definitions, uh, precarity, since this is one of the key terms here, originally signifying a social condition linked to poverty, Precarity has come to refer to the rise in flexible and precarious forms of labor, the growth of the knowledge economy, the reduction of welfare state provisions, the suppression of unions, and the association of migration with illegality. Alex Foti, however, makes a distinction between precarity and poverty, which is important. Poverty is an economic destitution where people are completely dependent on the state for their livelihood. Precarity, however, is the social condition marked by flexible employment and fluctuating income. And while the precariat is the class of people whose lives are precarious because they have little or no job security, the logic of precarity pervades the entirety of society. This will be very important to my own project. The precariat, uh, which is a neologism coined by Guy Standing in his book, The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class. Um, so this is the term that he coins in the book. And according to him, the restructuring of global and national economies over the last 40 years has produced this new class, social class, global class, characterized by chronic insecurity. And the precariat can include uh, any of the following uh, people and many more. These are just examples from illegal immigrants to tech workers, hotel workers, adjunct professors, and so on. Uh, in that book, the precariat, uh, Guy Sanding also distinguishes between seven classes that make up um, the structure of contemporary capitalist societies. And the precariat is only one of them, as you can see. The other ones being the elite, the salariat, proficients, the old core working class, the unemployed, and the lumpen precariat or the underclass. And according to Guy Standing, there are three main ways in which people fall into precarity or into that um, uh, position. Uh, and therefore, de depending on the way in which they become precarious, he distinguishes between three groups of precarious workers. Um, activists who are former working class members who have lost their access to meaningful uh, secure employment and thus have lost their past. Nostalgics who are mainly migrants and any minority members who have left their country in search of a better life and unable to find that uh, or unable to find work in their new countries, they lack a present. And progressives who are elucidated, mem educated members of the precariat who do not have access to a career path and thus lack a future. There have been various critiques of uh, Stanwyck's uh, notion of the precariat. Here I'll refer only to a couple. Uh, for example, Stanwyck defines precarity only in relation to insecure work, and thus makes it a very uh, historically specific phenomenon that then backs to the post 70s, a period of uh, market driven globalization. However, as feminist and post colonial scholars have uh, pointed out, many workers, especially women and people of color, have been for a very long time excluded from for this, for this regime of labor security. So that's one critique. Another critique by Konstantin Monalchev is that uh, Guy Standing tries to bring together under the same umbrella too many very different uh, groups, as you can see you know, from the previous uh, slide, uh, uh, typical uh, like uh, old uh, working class members, as well as uh, ethnic minority uh, members and migrants. So according to Monalchev, all of these groups have very difficult, different um, pasts and uh, futures and different objectives. And there is, it's not really clear how they're going to cohere into one, into one internally cohesive uh, class. Uh, and finally, Eric Wright uh, makes the point that uh, there is not a sufficient distinction between the precariat and the old working class, uh, because Guy Standing kind of distinguishes between them and thinks of them as two separate classes. Uh, 
Uh, so these are some of the critiques. I'm not going to get into all of them. Um, finally, moving on to the new European cinema of precarity. The term itself was coined by um, Lauren Berlan in her book, Cruel Optimism, in which she analyzes not just European films, more, films more globally speaking, not just European films, that dramatize the attrition of social fantasies like upward mobility, meritocracy, job security, political, social equality. And she identifies an emergent aesthetics that she calls the cinema of precarity, which is not really a movement or a genre or anything like that, or a historical period, it's just a, a class or uh, an umbrella term for these kinds of films. Originally referring, as we saw earlier, to lives mired in poverty, the term precarity only became attached to employment in the 1980s with neoliberal restructuring in the guise of flexible labor, uh, becoming a flexible, becoming a byword in national and transnational corporate politics. And she locates this shift in the terms meaning from just a limited structure to a pervasive life environment, in other words, uh, talking about the logic of precarity, to the 1990s and after, marking the emergence of a cinema precarity, which builds, according to her, upon the legacy of 1930s and 1940s Hollywood melodramas and post-war Italian new realism. Berlin focuses on French films mostly, but suggests that this is a global style that combines politics, melodrama, and new forms of realism that can be described as restrained, uh, minimalist, understated, and pervaded by a sense of fatigue and impasse. And here I've listed a few of the directors that she mentions in that book that she associates with this new cinema of precarity. The new European cinema of precarity, uh, as I have written in um, other articles that I've written on this topic, is distinguished by a wide range of genre and stylistic responses to the precarity of life under neoliberalism, from allegorical, uh, these are the titles of films that would fall under this, White God, Happy as Lazarus Transit, through experimental, bait from black comedies, to social dramas, from work musicals, um, to corporate psychothrillers, suggesting that traditional forms of social realism are no longer sufficient to capture the complexity of Europe's socio-political and moral crisis. In the cinema of precarity, precarity, precarity extends beyond the expression of an economic condition to indicate an entire affective environment, a sense of individualized insecurity and loss of existential and social status. And the cinema of precarity often investigates new potential conditions of solidarity that emerge between sub subjects with dissimilar historical identities or social locations, but with similar adjustment styles to the pressures of the emergent new ordinariness. In other words, she talks about this new lines of solidarity in um, films about precarity that cut across class, race, gender, and ethnicity. In line with uh, Berlin's expanded use of the term precarity, my own project does not focus exclusively on precarity as a social condition or a social class. In other words, I'm not interested in grouping, uh, kind of um, deciding who falls under the, uh, this category of uh, the precariat and who doesn't. Instead, my project explores the logic of precarity that pervades the entirety of society, the ways in which neoliberalism understood as a political philosophy rather than simply market fundamentalism, has led to the profound destruction of social bonds and to the production of social, economic, and political precarity, insecurity, and vulnerability. And I understand new liberalism following um, Maria Sally and Beverly Weber's book, uh, Precarious Intimacy, as describing this particular aspect of capitalism in which our lives are thoroughly saturated by market logic, which leads to an emphasis on hyper-individualism, self-maximization, potential, direction, goals, and increasing capacity. So uh, what are some of the precursors to the new European cinema of precarity? Here I've identified a few um, British documentaries from the late 20s, early 1930s, celebrating working class life, uh, 1930s depression era French films, especially poetic realist films. And this is in red because I will be focusing mostly on this since all of my examples today come from French cinema. Post-war Italian new realism. And I've uh, given you some of the characteristics of uh, each of these uh, movements or genres. I don't have the time to go into uh, you know, detail about each and every one of them. 1930s and 40s classical Hollywood melodrama, uh, British new wave films of the 1950s and 60s, and especially kitchen sink films. Um, and here again, I've given you some of the characteristics, um, but I don't have the time to uh, go into them. So since my examples come from French cinema, I'll focus now on depression era socially committed French cinema from the 1930s. What was the historical context in which these films emerged? Of course, the Great Depression, the rise of Hitler in Germany, the growth of far right leagues in France, the victory of the Popular Front, which is very important in this context, uh, which was an alliance of left wing, left -wing parties in, um, and which won the elections in uh, 1936. 
And some of the popular France achievements, which are crucial to understanding the historical context, uh, well, you know, the workers' right to strike and the right to collective bargaining, two weeks of paid annual leave, 40 hour working week, uh, increase in unemployment allowances, and many other achievements. Um, so during this period, the French left takes an active interest in the cinema as a vehicle for promoting their ideological cause. For example, in 1935, the cinematographic service of the Socialist Federation was established. Uh, this service made films emphasizing the fascist threat and the need to support the popular front. The films were uh, rented to socialist groups across France to, to, to be projected at party meetings. And this service also maintained the circulating library films focusing on contemporary social and economic problems and promoting working class solidarity. And on the other hand, the Communist Party uh, was also very active uh, during this period. For example, um, the Communist Party produced a film called Le Vie et Nous, or Life Belongs to Us, which was made by uh, many directors, but um, it's if you look, look on IMDb, uh, the Jean Renoir is credited as the director, but he's not the only person who uh, kind of contributed to this film. And the film was produced kind of through crowdfunding, crowdfunding at a mass party meeting. Uh, and uh, another example of this, uh, the interest that French left takes uh, in cinema during this period is the formation of Cine Liberté, which is a cooperative film group sponsored by the uh, Confédération Générale du Travail. And it was, um, it opposed politically motivated censorship and the standard commercial films of the period and produced uh, documentaries about the lives of workers and workers' strikes. And there were many branches of this um, group uh, around France, uh, around forming around workers and syndicates, and also in cafes and working class districts. Um, so during this period, starting in 1935, uh, films began exploring social problems like unemployment. Uh, and I've given you throughout uh, various examples of films that deal with these themes, migrant workers, uh, class conflict, uh, exploitation of wor the working class, the plight of um, uh, senior citizens, social disintegration, and in general, the working class uh, kind of emerges as this new protagonist after being neglected for a long time. And the worker proletarian hero in this socially committed cinema of the 1930s uh, oftentimes tends to romanticize um, uh, the worker, especially in the films of Marcel Carnet, on which he, uh, he collaborated with uh, French poet Jacques Prévert. Uh, or uh, if you go on the opposite extreme in the films of Jean Renoir, the representation of the worker is a little bit more realistic. Um, and uh, oftentimes Jean Renoir would take his film crews and his actors to uh, kind of spend some time and live in the social environment in which he would uh, then shoot the film in order to help the actors kind of uh, acclimate themselves and experience it firsthand. Um, <clears throat> despite the workers generally positive image in these films, in many of them, the worker protagonists end up committing murder and or suicide. This will be also very important in my uh, later analysis of contemporary films. And their antisocial behavior reveals a profound sense of social alienation, political impotence. Uh, the popular, popular front was dissolved in the autumn of 1938 because of various historical factors. I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, and so within that uh, period, the 1930s, of course, French poetic realism is just one particular type of films uh, that are made during that period. It's not like all films that were made in the 1930s are French poetic realist films, but um, what is characteristic, characteristics uh, what are the characteristics of, each of these films that were made in this period that uh, later were called French poetic realist films? They combine aspects of documentary type realism, focusing on everyday life, on real locations and mostly urban milieus. Uh, and they approach these kind of realistic uh, stories and uh, with a stylized or poetic approach um, that um, reveals the influence of German expressionism. So they often use expressionistic lighting, uh, dark shadows, long takes, staging in depth, in, especially in the case of uh, Renoir, emphasis on evocative set settings and atmosphere rather than plot and action. They focus on characters living on the margins of society, uh, usually unemployed members of the working class, petty criminals and so on. Many of them were influenced by Emil Zola, um, uh, his topical stories about uh, labor unrest, prostitution, the rise of consumer society. Uh, and many of them were, le most of them were left-leaning of course, and were, they were permeated uh, with pessimism and fatalism, which is one of the legacy uh, of Zola's naturalism and determinism, um, the sense that there is no way, way out of the, the social class to which uh, you belong and uh, the condition that uh, under which you live. And they themselves influenced later movements, uh, most importantly film noir in uh, Hollywood and Italian new realism and the French new wave. Uh, 
Um, some of the most representative films of this movement, uh, poetic realism, are the following. Uh, films by uh, Jean Vigot, Marcel Carnet, Jean Renoir, and uh, Julien Duvivier. And if we compare these films made in the 1930s uh, in the, during the Depression to post-1990s uh, European films of precarity, specifically French films, um, I'm not going to go into detail summarizing you know, the storylines of all of these 1930s films, but one thing that I wanted to point out by taking just a few of these examples of these four films here, is that uh, some, many of these films um, represent uh, focus on a middle-class protagonist uh, who kind of experiences a, sort of a declassement, in other words, a falling out of his middle-class status. Uh, and that by the end of the film, they end up basically living in the street. And what is interesting about these films is that uh, most of them present this uh, declassement, this falling out you know, from your middle-class uh, kind of a status not as a degrading or as anxiety producing, but rather as, as liberating and as a more kind of leading to a more authentic existence. Um, so interestingly, oops, uh, a few of the early films of precarity, of contemporary films of precarity that I will be talking about more um, in more detail later on, such as uh, Dernier Ete or Last Summer by Guedignan, uh, Les Amants du Pont Neuf or Lovers on the Bridge by Leo Scarax and Western by Manuel Poirier. They recall such early uh, depression era films like Le Chien, Boudou Safe from Drowning and The Lower Depths, the ones that, I, uh, that were in the previous slide, by treating precarity in terms of a conflict between freedom and bourgeois convention and depicting falling out of the social order as liberating rather than degrading. However, post 1990s films no longer romanticize this precarious existence of a drifter, and instead they present the loss of employment and social status as a devastating experience equivalent to falling out of society altogether and depriving one's life of meaning and losing one's sense of identity, often even having a psychotic breakdown. How do uh, depression era films versus contemporary films of precarity uh, envision alternatives to capitalism or neoliberalism? In the 1930s, in the depression era films of the 1930s, if the films envision an alternative realm outside capitalism, it is either uh, in romantic love or in working class solidarity, uh, most often male camaraderie, since most of the protagonists are male. But in most films, mo both of these end in failure. And I've given you some examples here. For example, La Belle Equipe um, uh, by Duvivier traces the disintegration of uh, five unemployed friends, fraternal solidarity, but eventually, you know, that solidarity disintegrates mostly because of a, a femme fatale or proto-femme fatale. Um, Renoir's Le Bête Human or The Human Beast, uh, which focuses on a train engineer tortured by a genetic disease, falls in love with a proto-femme fatale married woman. She asks him, asks him to help her get rid of her husband and the film ends with the protagonist killing his lover and committing suicide. The rules of the game also ends with a murder and most, and most famously, Le Jour sur Lève by Carnet ends with the working class protagonist killing the man exploiting his romantic interest and then committing suicide. In post 1990s cinema of precarity, romantic love doesn't play such an important role. If the protagonist is romantically involved at all, their romantic partner is either secondary to the story or contributes to the protagonist's conflict rather than providing a possible way out of it. And working class solidarity is constantly under threat. Crime in depression era films, crime, um, since I talked about murder and suicide, happens within a social setting. And we generally see other, uh, other characters' reaction to it. For example, in the films that I mentioned, we uh, witness the murder or suicide or murder suicide of the protagonist. And then we see the characters close to them, whether they're friends or neighbors, or even strangers reacting to that crime. But in the post 1990s films of precarity, murder and or suicide happen either off screen uh, or very abruptly without allowing us, allowing us to witness other characters' reaction to it. In other words, uh, characters' crises, uh, moral, emotional, and financial crises are often presented as internal, isolated, and very isolating rather than part of a larger social context. And this has to do with the complete disintegration of social bonds under neoliberalism, as we will see. Uh, what are the dominant female types in these types of films? In the Depression era, I've identified two dominant female types, the innocent young woman whose love the male protagonist seeks as a last chance to uh, extricate himself from his conditions. And as I said before, usually that ends in disaster, or the manipulative uh, femme fatale who either destroys the man financially, emotionally, and morally, or represents an obstacle to working class solidarity. In contemporary films, women play mostly subordinate roles, either functioning as the male protagonist's voice of conscience, or providing uh, moral and emotional support. 
And here I also want to distinguish between uh, films uh, featuring female protagonists that uh, experience um, uh, uh, precarity versus films that are centered on male protagonists. In films featuring female protagonists, um, the, the depiction of the loss of job, loss of employment, loss of work and social status is presented as uh, um, demoralizing and anxiety producing, whereas in films that uh, feature male protagonists, oftentimes the loss of employment or loss of status is at least initially presented as liberating, which as we saw is a, something that we already saw in the 1930s, and this tendency continues in the present as well. Stylistic differences in the 1930s poetic realist films, um, as I said before, they're characterized by their heightened uh, aestheticism, that's why they're called poetic realist films, in other words, they're realist, but at the same time, they're very um, uh, poetic in the sense that they uh, uh, draw attention to their style. Um, anticipating future film noir films with their chiaroscuro lighting, dramatic shadows, often they use rain and fog, with deep focus in cinematography. Contemporary European cinema precarity on the other hand is most often characterized um, as, as being minimal, minimalist, restrained, understated um, uh, and realistic and pervaded by a sense of fatigue and impasse rather than tragedy and doom as in the case of 1930s films. And uh, the proto-noir legacy of poetic realism continues mostly interestingly in contemporary films focused on white collar protagonists, where, whereas those that focus on working class protagonists generally follow the tradition of social realism. Here, um, I've started mapping out some of the specific uh, correlations or uh, continuities between uh, 1930s films and more recent films, French films, uh, since I'm talking only about French films today. But I don't really have the time to go into detail, but uh, as you can see, there are already some similarities. And sometimes um, the later film, the more contemporary film is kind of a very openly references the 1930 film. For example, Early One Morning, which I'll be discussing in detail later on, is a, an homage to uh, Le Jour Célève. As you can see from the description of the plot, it's exactly the same plot. Only in the earlier film, the main protagonist is a working class man. And in the latter film, it's a white collar worker. Um, so moving on to the second part of my presentation. So as I said before, I'll be talking uh, only about French cinema today. And I'll be discussing the following films, uh, which I'm basically considering as embodying different moments in the historical development of neoliberalism. Uh, uh, and I've divided them, as you can see by the colors here, into three stages or groups. And I'm not really arguing that we can um, kind of correlate these three stages directly with William Davis's distinction between the three stages of neoliberalism that I referred to earlier, combative, uh, normative, and punitive, but there are certain continuities that cannot be ignored. Um, so the first two films I'll be talking about uh, last summer, and uh, throughout the discussion, I'll be referring to the English titles, um, just for the sake of ease of the films, but I've given you also the original titles. Uh, and I'll pronounce the words of all the characters in English, or mostly. Um, so uh, last summer and the lovers on the fridge, uh, on the bridge, sorry, are the first films that I'll be talking about. Last summer by Robert Guignan, 1981, uh, set in Estac against the background of France's deindustrialization. Last summer follows a group of friends in their twenties as they try to adapt to the new economic reality setting in, with factories closing down and paid work hard to come by. Gilbert, the main character, and his friends spend their days hanging out, doing odd jobs, and resorting to petty crime. The shipyard where Gilbert has been working, a temporary job, appears periodically, but only in an extreme long shot, a relic from another time. The film mixes elements of Italian neorealism and film noir's fatalism. In its exploration of the decomposition of the working class, the film calls to mind British kitchen sink dramas, especially in the way it figures the generational conflict between the unemployed youth and their parents, especially fathers. Gilbert has chosen the precarious life of a petty thief working short-term contracts over that of his father, an alcoholic, whose life of permanent employment at the shipyard, Gilbert does, not, Gilbert does not see as something worth fighting for. Unlike kitchen sink dramas, however, Guidignan's characters are not explicitly resentful of their social status or preoccupied with class mobility. On the contrary, Gilbert brags that he works only one month of the year and is free to do as he pleases the rest of the time. As much as Gilbert and his friends love their freedom, the sense of impasse they feel is perceptible in the cyclical nature of the story, which keeps finding the group of friends circulating between the same locations over and over again, the bar, the nightclub, the beach. Gilbert and his friends enjoy their precarious lives, which are not devoid of little pleasures like chasing after women and hanging out at the bar. 
although they're penniless, their conversations do not revolve around money or debt. While a few decades earlier, the 1960s or later, the 2000s, their refusal to work might have been theorized as a gesture of revolt, here it is not anymore or not yet that. When they make off from cafes without paying or when they commit petty thefts, they're hardly rebelling against the class structure. And yet, even though they do not exhibit an explicit political consciousness based on their shared precarious circumstances, the bonds of friendship or togetherness that sustain them and prevent them from seeing themselves as victims represent, in Joseph Mai's words, a search for a new form of politics. Drawing on political philosopher Todd May's notion of consumers and entrepreneurs as the two primary figures of the neoliberal age, and on May's theorization of friendship as an alternative to neoliberal relationships, Mai suggests that Guédignan's films constitute a profoundly original and durable project of living together. Gilbert and his friends are neither waxing reminiscent about the past, nor desperately looking for jobs to assure their future. The stability and sense of security that the Fordist regime guaranteed their parents is not something they seek to return to or fight for. On the contrary, the life of their parents is precisely what they rebel against, seeing it as a kind of self-imposed slavery to which even a life of uncertainty is preferable. It is this sense of youthful rebellion that animates as well Leo Carax's film Lovers on the Bridge. Although the film Lovers on the Bridge begins with a documentary style, and this is made in 1991, Set in a homeless shelter, it is not an expose about poverty, but a love story between two seemingly equally disenfranchised individuals, Alex and Michelle, whose backstory is left vague so that it's unclear whether their precarious existence is a matter of choice or not. Later in the film, it becomes clear that it is. In the homeless shelter, a friend of Alex offers him the chance to move to the south of France, but Alex chooses to return to the bridge and continue to live uh, you know, this street life. Michelle, uh, who you can see here, a painter suffering from a degenerative eye disease, who initially appears to be homeless, like Alex, turns out to be the daughter of a middle-class military man. Abandoned by her lover and heartbroken, she has left her former life or life in the street. Although at the end of the street, uh, sorry, at the end of the film, um, Michelle's eyesight is restored and Alex is released from prison and they're both given the chance to start a new life together. They both choose what they see as a more authentic life of ecstasy over the normal, secure bourgeois life that they're both given the chance to pursue. They randomly decide to join an old couple driving a barge on the sand with no concrete plans on how they're going to make ends meet. Like Gilbert in the previous film, Michelle and Alex see precarious existence as the morally, spiritually, and romantically more authentic choice, despite the economic uncertainty this choice entails. Their attitude towards money is captured in the sequence in which Michelle inadvertently pushes the box full of money that they have earned by robbing men in cafes into the river, an event that could have been seen as tragic given the economic predicament, but that the film passes over as dramatically insignificant. To sum up, both Last Summer and The Lovers on the Bridge stage a refusal, the refusal of a normal, ordinary life, whether that life is understood in generational terms, as in Last Summer, or existential terms, as in Lovers. By the late 1990s and early 2000s, however, this romantic reading of precarity, fatalistic in one case and exuberantly defined in the second case, understood positively as freedom, uncertainty, unpredictability, youthful rebellion, is no longer possible. The next four films I consider, The Dream Life of Angels, Human Resources, Time Out, and Work Hard, Play Hard, are not only more downbeat, but also more preoccupied with questions of class and class conflict, though they tackle this issue in a very different way, narratively and stylistically. Shot on a small budget on 16 millimeter equipment and praised as an example of humorous cinema and a naturalistic fable, the film Dream Life of, The Dream Life of Angels focuses on the precarious lives of unexceptional characters Critics praise the film for privileging close shots um, that prompt us to observe how the characters are contained or circumscribed by their environment, as well as using relatively unknown actors so as to allow the audience to perceive them as ordinary people living through a documentary situation. Set in a small French town in northern France, the film follows the intertwined lives of tomboyish Issa and masochistic cynical Marie, two young women of working class origins who have spent their entire lives working random short term jobs. Issa moves in with Marie, who is house sitting for a woman and her daughter, um, who have suffered a car accident. The woman is dead and her teenage daughter is in a coma. So that's why the apartment is free and the two young women move in there. The women befriend two bouncers who they meet in a nightclub. And Marie begins the relationship with one of them, but she soon breaks it off trying to escape her miserable life through an affair with a rich nightclub owner who eventually leaves her. Both characters are typical naturalist heroines, pr products of economic deprivation, and in the case of Marie, abusive family environment. The film is interested less in a portrayal of the typical working class and its manners 
than in analyzing the women's strategies of adjustment to their precarious existence. While Issa demonstrates class solidarity with other disenfranchised characters, Marie is tormented by a hyper-awareness that social mobility is just a dream and by her resentment of her own class origins. In the final scene, as Issa begins a new job in a computer cables factory, um, the camera tracks right to show her co-workers, and one of them, surprisingly, is Sandrine, the girl who was in a coma recently. Why is someone of a stable middle-class background working at this job? Christopher Orr reads the ending as presenting a realistic assessment of the insecurity that both the middle and working classes face under the new world order of multinational capitalism, while offering a glimmer of hope in the struggle against this threat through solidarity among the classes. Human Resources, uh, made in 1999, revolves around the transformation of the French working class within the context of the demise of Fordism and the specific case of the implementation of the 35-hour working week, a new labor regime associated with the casualization of labor in weakening unions. Set in a small Normandy town and shot in a real factory with mostly non-professional actors, the film follows Frank, a management student who returns to his hometown to do an internship in the HR office of the factory where his father has worked for 30 years. Eager to impress management, but also sympathetic to, to the workers' plight, Frank naively proposes a referendum to assess workers' attitudes towards instituting a 35-hour work week, only to find out that his boss is planning to use the referendum to justify downsizing, his father being among those to be fired. The film reveals the intimate connection between the crisis of Fordism and the crisis of white masculinity by stressing the emasculating effect of Frank's father's impending unemployment. At one point, the wife, his wife says he cried like a woman. The film, after learning that he's going to be unemployed. The film explores the decomposition of the working class and significantly locates the possibility for change, not in the traditional working class embodied by Frank's father, who actually refuses to join the strike, instigated by his own son, but uh, locates the possibility for change in Frank, a man with a split class identity who feels equally alienated from workers and management. Human Resources is one of the films discussed under the category New Realism, or the return of the political in French cinema in the 1990s. Aesthetically, new realist films are distinguished by naturalistic mise-en-scene, combining a documentary-style approach with intimate, often handheld camera work that suggests empathy for the characters. Human Resources is, uh, fits in this category because it's characterized by flat, natural lighting, little or no stylization in terms of color or decor, and the preference was the single camera take, and it uses ambient sound, such as the monotonous drone of machinery emanating from the factory, uh, rather than using a musical score, as in a Hollywood film. The political within new, new realism is not militant, but rather raw and dispersed, given that the new social movements in the period when the film was made are more diverse and fragmented compared to the 1960s, for instance. For instance. Uh, public revolt against neoliberalism, rejection of the EU constitution in 2005, mass student mobilization against new liberal employment regulations and uprisings in the banlieue, in the suburbs. Like other European films dealing with questions of labor and management, whose protagonists also search for alternatives to their precarious worlds without a fully formed political framework, human resources lacks the unified class protagonist of 1960s committed cinema. However, the representation of precarity in the movie is not an obstacle to political struggle, even if the struggle is fragmented. For example, it is with Alain, a black worker who befriends Frank, that Frank collaborates to sabotage the factory. Thus, despite being invisible, the non-white identity is central to recovering the language of solidarity. What if a man loses his job but continues to live his life as if nothing happened? This is the premise of Time Out, or L'Emploi du Temps, by Laurent Canté, made in 2001, in which Vincent, a company executive, fails to inform his family that he has lost his job. By fails, I mean he intentionally doesn't tell them. Vincent begins his unpremedi unpremedi oh, sorry, unpremeditated de defection from the corporate world by accidentally driving past an exit on his way to a business meeting. Rather than correcting his mistake, he lets himself drift to the point where he's forced to leave his real job, invent a fictitious job at the UN office in, G in Geneva, and eventually turn to criminal activities. Unlike Frank in Human Resources, Vincent is not tormented by class conflict, but by a type of introverted rebellion against the corporate world he has come to loathe. Notable about his adjustment strategy to his precarious existence is the absence of despair or anxiety he displays. As Laurent Berland argues, when crisis is no longer experienced as traumatic, but as crisis ordinariness, the response to it takes the form of an impasse rather than trauma. As Vincent postpones informing his family that he has lost his job, his behavior becomes increasingly random and absurd, 
He goes into random office buildings pretending to be an employee. He stands outside his house observing his family and at one point travels to a winter cottage in the Alps where he spends his time reading brochures that he picked up at the UN office, inventing a fake investment opportunity that he later tries to sell to friends from his college days. Opting out of satisfying the neoliberal imperative of constantly working to maintain his job and his employability, Vincent retreats into a life of napping, sleeping, spacing out, wandering in known places like hotel lobbies, parking lots and office waiting areas. But what he does when he's not working, in other words, the imaginary job that he invents as an altruistic UN bureaucrat in charge of third world development, or the Ponzi scheme he orchestrates to extract money from old friends, or the smuggling operation of counterfeit goods he joins, all of this links Vincent's artful dissimulation with the false promises of a faltering European economic order. On one hand, Vincent's time out could be read in terms of Peter Fleming's analysis of silence, sleep, absenteeism, sickness, and suicide as political strategies of resistance embodying the logic of refusal, the refusal to talk to power. However, time out also reveals the surreptitious ways in which neoliberalism co-opts such forms of resistance. The pleasure Vincent takes in his freedom from a nine to five job his transient flexible life, which allows him to design his days as he pleases, to use time literally as he pleases, underpins new liberal values of flexibility, autonomy, self-entrepreneurship, and network subjectivity. Unlike human resources, which explores a clearly defined class conflict from an external point of view, setting the social drama on the factory floor, Time Out is a psychological thriller that puts us directly in Vincent's, Vincent's subjective point of view. Unlike Frank in Human Resources, who is looking for his place in society, torn between two clearly defined class identities, his white collar status as an elite business school graduate and his loyalty to his working class roots, Vincent already has a place, a job and a loving family from which he's however no less alienated. However, Vincent experiences alienation not as a class bound experience, but as an experience of derealization bordering on a psychotic break. Instead of being Vincent, Vincent must play himself perform the role of a breadwinner, loving husband and father. Opting out of his job means quite literally opting out of reality, severing all personal and social bonds that used to sustain him. In the film's penultimate scene, Vincent abandons his car in the middle of nowhere and walks away into the night, presumably to kill himself. However, in the final scene, we see him being interviewed for a new job. As the camera zooms in on Vincent's face, the HR person tells him that he's offering him an exciting new venture not just a business venture, but a human one that requires a strong personal investment from him. Vincent forces a smile and says he's not afraid, but his ashen face cannot conceal his sense of dread and what, at what amounts to a symbolic suicide. The only way for Vincent to reinsert himself back into reality is through reintegrating himself in the corporate world. The sense of existential dread he experiences throughout the film reveals that opting out of the logic of neoliberalism does not merely lead to unemployment or poverty. The effect on one's sense of self are much more pervasive and potentially pathological. Work Hard, Play Hard, um, uh, released in 2003, came out during a period of labor unrest in France that saw tens of thousands of public sector workers take to the streets to express opposition to the government's move toward privatization and inadequate salaries and benefits. The film revolves around Philippe, a young business management graduate who joins a Parisian management consultancy company specializing in mergers. The company's ruthless and charismatic headhunter, Hugo Paradis, assigns Philippe to do an audit on a company that is about to be taken over by another, with a view to deciding which operations need to be downgraded or shut down. Armed with a chronometer, literally, Philippe is sent to the shop floor to measure the efficiency of each employee and dismiss the least efficient ones, which of course are single mothers and people with physical disabilities. The role of Eva, Philippe's girlfriend, a single mother in precarious employment, is to serve as Philippe's moral conscience, which she does by breaking off their relationship with him because of his decision to proceed with the dismissal of 80 workers. Although Philippe is sympathetic to the workers and befriends the company's Muslim cafeteria chef, the possibility for a cross-class alliance quickly evaporates and at the end of the film, Philippe overcomes his crisis of conscience. The parallels between human resources and work hard, play hard are unmistakable. In both films, a business school graduate is torn between his desire to advance his career and his sympathies for the workers. But in this case, since we know nothing about Philippe's family or background, other than that he's not from Paris, his inner conflict is not dramatized in class or generational terms as it was in human resources, but instead in romantic terms. Philippe must choose not between his sympathies for a precariat class represented by Eva, to which he does not belong himself, or and the managerial class represented by Hugo, 
Rather, Philippe's choice is framed as one between career and personal happiness, a conflict we are familiar with from women's films. In fact, in the documentary, uh, Paris La Sortie, um, uh, the exit is this way, which the director himself made about the, the reception of his own film. In this documentary, most audience members, when they were interviewed about the film, confirmed that this is how they understood the film, blaming Eva for forcing Philippe to choose between love and career. Unlike human resources, which tells a specific story, but through that comments on the larger processes of class decomposition, the weakening of labor unions, and the crisis of white masculinity, Work Hard presents Philippe's story as that of a single man's moral, ethical and, ethical and moral degradation, framing it as a conflict between financial gain and personal ethics, rather than as an exploration of the systemic violence of neoliberalism evoked in the film's title. Only five years separate Human Resources, 1998, and Work Hard, Play Hard, 2003. Yet the simple fact that Frank, in the, in the previous film, aligns himself with the workers to whose class he no longer belongs, while Philippe ends up internalizing the managerial discourse of his charismatic boss and naturalizing it as something inevitable, the law of the market, reveals the extent to which neoliberalism has by now, by this point, entered what William Davis calls its normative stage. If any further evidence of this were necessary, Mouton's documentary on the reception of his own film provides it. Asked to comment on Philippe's choice, uh, most audience members expressed indignation, but were, however, reluctant to judge Philippe arguing that, that he didn't really have a choice, that life is like that. The audience's reaction indicates the force with which the logic of neoliberalism has penetrated everyday ways of thinking, including the imagination of what is possible. To sum up, both the dream life of angels and human resources explore repressed feelings of class shame and resentment against the backdrop of the decomposition of the working class, in one case with tragic consequences, Mary suicide in the dream life of angels. In Time Out, which shifts the attention to the state of white collar labor under neoliberalism, the protagonist's refusal to obey neoliberal imperatives of work echoes similar gestures of refusal or revolt dramatized in Last Summer and Lovers on the Bridge. However, unlike these two films, Time Out pursues the terrifyingly real consequences of this refusal and the pathologies it gives rise to, such as leading a double life. But the time we get, by the time we get to work hard, play hard, the idea of revolt, whether in the sense of refusing to work, as Gilbert does in Last Summer, choosing a life outside normative reality as Michelle and Alex do in Lovers on the Bridge, instigating a strike uh, as Frank does or taking time out as Vincent does, begins to seem unimaginable. Despite its narrative similarities to human resources, work hard, play hard no longer stages the conflict between labor and capital in class terms, but rather in ethical and thus psychological terms, pointing perhaps to the difficulty of imagining alternatives to neoliberalism, at least in the traditional sense of uh, class struggle, understood in the Marxist sense. Films made after 2007-2008 uh, global financial crisis reflect the deepening pathologies of neoliberalism. Vincent's symbolic suicide gives way to Kessler's psychotic breakdown, as we will see shortly, Gregoire's real suicide in um, Mia Hansen's Love's Father of My Children, Paul's murder slash suicide in Early One Morning, and many other films, and uh, Laurent's suicide in At War. In Heartbeat Detector, uh, which the original title is uh, The Human Question, uh, La Question Humaine. Uh, Simon Kessler is a psychologist employed by the French subsidiary of a German petrochemical company to evaluate the mental health of his employees and advise on firings. He's hired by the company's German president, Karl Rose, to secretly observe and report on Matthias Just, the company's CEO, who appears to be on the verge of a breakdown. As a cover for his investigation, Kessler suggests reforming a string quartet in which Just used to play with other employees. And a member of the quartet turns out to be Ari Newman, a Jewish musician and disgruntled former employee who has been sending anonymous letters to Just, the CEO. As Kessler investigates Just's secret past, he begins to uncover disturbing connections between the workings of international corporations and the Holocaust, while his own perception of reality becomes skewed. The first time Kessler becomes aware of the analogy between corporate policy and the Holocaust is when he compares the original version of Rose's restructuring plan in German to its redacted French translation. As he sits on the floor in his apartment, mechanically mounting the German words he reads, relocation, restructuration, the specter of the Holocaust begin to haunt the film. And what was initially a metaphorical connection between corporate policy of downsizing and the extermination of the Jews becomes actually literal. After reading the German draft of the company policy, Kessler finds himself for the very first time unable to complete what should have been a routine selection file, selecting workers to be fired. While there are obvious 
continuities between heartbeat detector and work hard, play hard, there are also significant differences. In, uh, hard, sorry, in work hard, Philip is hired to participate in the restructuring of the company by evaluating workers' efficiency understood in material terms. Literally, he measures their speed with a little chronometer. Kessler evaluates the employee's mental fit, their capacity for self-management, self-discipline. Kessler's dilemma, like Philippe's, is framed in ethical terms, but while for Philippe the ethical conflict was a personal one, he has to choose between his girlfriend and his career, not only is Kessler's ethical dilemma given much broader significance by linking it to the Holocaust, but the dilemma also drives Kessler, a psychologist, to the edge of a psychotic breakdown, demonstrating that the norms according to which neoliberalism reproduces itself as a political philosophy are not immune to the pathologies they're supposed to punish. As I have argued in my last book, The Figure of the Migrant in Contemporary European Cinema, one of the defining characteristics of contemporary European films dealing with migration is their tendency to frame ethical questions raised by migrants and refugees in terms of past forms of oppression and marginalization, especially the Holocaust. Heartbeat Detector shows that the analogy between the extermination of the Jews and the expulsion of migrants and refugees from fortress Europe has now been extended to the cinema of precarity, which similarly draws a parallel between the inhumanity and efficiency of the new liberal technocratic order and the ideology of national socialism, between systemic racism, the exploitation of workers, and the extermination of the Jews. It is not accidental that the scene in which Kessler reads the German version of the company's policy is followed immediately by another in which the police raid an Arab-run cafe and arrest only the black patrons. In the opening sequence of early one morning, Paul, manager at the International Credit and Trade Bank, arrives in the office on time, takes out a gun, and shoots his boss and another employee. Then he locks himself at his office, and as he waits for the police, he reflects on the events that led his, to this day. The film engages directly with the 2008 financial crisis. The dialogue is full of reference to subprime loans, refinancing, foreclosure, and like the other films discussed here, reveals the deepening psychopathologies of neoliberalism through the recurring motifs of psychotic breakdown, suicide, and murder. What is notable about Time Out, Work Hard, Play Hard, Heartbeat Detector, and Early One Morning, all of whose protagonists are white collar workers, is how they're, different, how they're different from the quasi documentary look of Last Summer, The Dream Life of Angels and Human Resources, which center on working class characters. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, in uh, films featuring white uh, collar protagonists, um, the style is much closer to film noir rather than to social realist films. White collar films explore the world of work, not within the framework of social realism, but in the form of what appears to be an emerging hybrid genre, the corporate psychothriller, which draws on the psychological thriller, film noir, melodrama, privileging subjective over objective storytelling. Time Out, for example, features an unreliable narrator. Uh, Early One Morning uses the flashback structure typical of noir films like Double Indemnity and Sunset Boulevard. And Heartbeat Detector draws on film noir, detective films, psychothrillers, the Holocaust film, and European art cinema. The emphasis on character subjectivity uh, renders visual the hidden pathologies of neoliberalism. Time Out and Early One Morning are not concerned with representing a particular social problem, whether it's unemployment, labor unrest, or class conflict, but with exploring adjustment strategies, most often the failure to adjust to the new spirit of neoliberalism, understood as the extension of economic logic to all areas of life. Similarly, Work Hard, Play Hard, and Heartbeat Detector are not about precarity as a socioeconomic phenomena, but about the ethical, moral, human limits or costs of neoliberalism. The sense of derealization Vincent suffers after quitting his job ultimately forces him to re-enslave himself. Unlike Vincent, whose revolt takes the form of drifting and absenteeism, Paul tries to fight actively against the economic logic of this world. When one of his female colleagues, for example, is fired, supposedly because Paul's report showed her to be underperforming, Paul encourages her to sue the bank for wrongful dismissal. We will fight them together, he tells her passionately, but she turns him down. Thus, although the film hinted possible alternatives to neoliberalism, Vincent, through Vincent's absenteeism or Paul's nostalgic reminiscences of the nonprofit work he once did in Mali, uh, building a school for the local kids, ultimately none of these alternatives provide a way out. The last two films I discussed, The Measure of a Man and At War, both by Stéphane Brise, operate within the conventions of social, social realist drama, working class characters, non-professional actors, episodic narratives, and quasi-documentary feel. The Measure of a Man, or Le Loi du Marché, uh, begins with a series of interactions between Thierry and various, the main character, and various representatives of the institutional network on which his life has depended until now. In At War, um, the other film that I'm going to talk about, also follows the main characters. He meets various representatives of the state, the justice system, and the corporate world. The Measure of a Man opens literally mid-sentence, with Thierry speaking to an agent in the Office of Unemployment. At War begins with media coverage of the workers' strike which continues throughout the film. 
Every major shift in the face-off between labor and management is immediately followed by a media report. This stress on reporting, documenting, which frames the story as real, actual, authentic, representative, points to new, realism, new realism's continuing influence. White collar films rarely make such a claim to reality, drawing instead, as I said before, on highly subjective genres like film noir and psychological thrillers. In the first scenes of The Measure of a Man or Le Loi du Marché, an unemployed factory worker, Thierry, meets with an unhel unhelpful unemployment agency employee, a bank employee who advises him to sell his apartment to take care of his loved ones after he's gone, and with a humiliating recruiter who, after assessing Thierry's willingness to work flexible hours for less money, informs him he has no chance of getting the job he's interviewing for. These scenes dramatize the power that previously minor characters representing various governmental mechanisms and structures from banks through unemployment agencies to HR offices play now in sustaining and determining our lives. Another scene set at the performance management workshop during which Thierry's peers dutifully dissect his body, poor body language, rhythm of speech and vocabulary renders visible the ways in which new liberalism's governmental practices pass through the individual. The measure of a man makes it immediately clear that it is not about unemployment, but about the human limits or costs of neoliberalism. As Thierry tells the agent in the office of unemployment, you cannot treat people like this. You, in this case, is not synonymous only with the boss or management, it includes everyone. For example, when Thierry and his wife are forced to sell their mobile home by the sea, the family interested in buying it try to get Thierry to lower the price, framing their demand as an opportunity to, quote, plan for the future, move on to other things, echoing the way in which management usually presents the loss of jobs as an exciting opportunity to pursue new plans. Every conflict in the film is motivated by the extension of economic logic and market values, such as performance, to social and personal relations. Selling the family mobile home at a heavily discounted price means putting a price tag on the many happy years Thierry spent there with his family. Mock job interviews are about disciplining bodies to make them marketable, measuring rhythm of speech, amiability, expression. Education is about the same thing. For example, Thierry's disabled son has to meet the same standards of performance and efficiency as his father. Once Thierry gets a job as a supermarket security guard, uh, the perverse logic of neoliberalism is exposed. He's forced to collude with management in restructuring the company that employs him, spying not only on customers from behind surveillance cameras, but also on his own fellow workers. Uh, one of the cashiers, Mrs. Anselmi, is caught stealing coupons and it is fired right away. The following day, she commits suicide. After Mrs. Anselmi is fired and her dismissal is framed in psychological terms, she betrayed the company's trust, making downsizing appear no different from a breakup. HR organizes a grief management workshop whose purpose is to psychologize away the structural violence to which all employees are subjected. Work did not define Mrs. Anselmi's entire life, the head of HR tells employees at the grieving, grieving uh, workshop. No one can really know the reason, i.e. be responsible for her suicide. When at the end of the film theory is faced with the prospect of having to witness and participate in the firing of another store cashier, he quits his job. As in many European films influenced by the Dardenne brothers, Stefan Brzez's handheld camera keeps following Thierry from behind throughout the film. In the three crucial scenes set in a little back room in the store where store thieves are taken for processing, Thierry is positioned off to the side, the camera remaining behind him, denying us access to his face, his reactions. The camera puts the viewer in the position of an observer, a position that mirrors Thierry's own position in these scenes, forcing us, just like Thierry, to ask ourselves what we would do in this situation. By framing every encounter in the film as an ethical test, Brzez's camera provides an alternative to neoliberalism's reduction of social relations to quasi-metric aggregates. In last summer, Gilbert's refusal to work was not ethically and moral or morally determined. In The Measure of a Man, however, Thierry chooses a life of uncertainty and precarity rather than live by the law of the market. While his gesture of refusal to be complicit in the punitive system that both rewards and disciplines those like him and Mrs. Anselmi is ethically unquestionable, its political significance is harder to decipher. His individual gesture refusal proceeds from the individual atomization of precarity, not from a collective sense of class consciousness. Despite Thierry's commendable moral choice, uh, basically he says the law of the market cannot serve as the moral or ethical law, the film hardly registers it as some sort of victory. The fact that Thierry's refusal to participate in new liberal practices of surveillance and punishment is not instantaneous, suggests that just as the market does not reproduce itself automatically according to some magical laissez-faire formula, but has to be sustained by some combination of state and corporate forces, so the moral or ethical law does not kick in automatically but demands an effort. Thierry's decision to quit his job happens only after he has already colluded with the management's disciplinary measures.
In the final sequence, the camera follows him from behind as he leaves the mall and walks away through the parking lot. But since we don't see his face, we are denied access to his thoughts and emotions at this crucial moment. How long can he uphold his moral and ethical stance in an environment that punishes the kind of choice he just made? The challenge of reading this ending as anything else but impasse rather than revolt is further augmented by what we know about Thierry from an early sequence in the film. When other workers try to convince him to join their efforts to sue for wrongful dismissal, Thierry refuses, telling, telling them that he must take care of his mental health. Finally, at war, 2018. An automat automotive parts plant in Agen is deemed non-competitive and ordered closed by its German management. The workers, having agreed two years prior to forego bonuses and work additional unpaid hours, vote to strike, led by Laurent, the main character. The struggle of the workers to gain access to the seats of real rather than symbolic power, before which to voice their demands, is reminiscent of Kafka's novel, The Castle, in which a protagonist known only as Kay arrives in a village and struggles to gain access to the mysterious authorities who govern it from a nearby castle. While Brise paints the industrial debate as a class conflict with labor and management in a perpetual face-off, he's also attentive to the ways in which class struggle has changed. Although there are scenes of workers protesting in front of the factory or the company headquarters, the crucial parts of the story of the mostly verbal struggle happen in meeting rooms with workers trying to break through management's purposefully evasive corporate lingo. Throughout the film, Laurent demonstrates the importance of knowledge capital to class struggle, knowledge of marketing, political economy, the justice system, geopolitics. It is because Laurent is knowledgeable about the company's operations in a transnational context that he is able to argue that the factory is not non-competitive, that the real reason for closing it is to relocate operations to Romania in a factory with fewer workers working for less. To fight intelligently, as Laurent calls on workers to do, Workers must think like accountants and political economists and understand the workings of global capitalism. In fact, Hauser, the CEO of the German group Dimke, of which the French company is a subsidiary, is so impressed by Laurent's knowledge of the market that he tells him at one point that he would make a great CEO. The market, an abstract idea, emerges as a central protagonist in the film. The financial director of the German Dimke group blames the closing of the factory on the market. The reason for closing the factory, he says, is not in my office, not in the factory, but external to both of us. It's the law of the market in which we are all fighting. This was a quote. The way in which neoliberals like Hauser blame the exploitation of workers on the market, presenting it as an impersonal force over which no one, including neoliberals, have control, confirms that one of the central strategies neoliberalism uses to perpetuate itself is to invoke the obsolete notion of laissez-faire in order to disavow the role of the state and the justice system in creating and sustaining a market-friendly culture. The law, of course, protects the interests of the shareholders. The law makes it mandatory to find a new buyer when the French factory closes, but does not oblige Hauser to sell to that buyer. As for the state, as if, uh, um, if it seems to support at first the workers through empty symbolic gestures, it immediately withdraws its support after the workers physically attack Hauser. It is not only the nature of class struggle that has changed, but also the stakes. In The Measure of a Man, Thierry is fighting to put bread on the table while preserving his personal integrity. In At War, when the workers finally meet Hauser, the CEO of the German company, Laurent declares forcefully that the aim of class war is not a paycheck at the end of the month. Quote, we have come here for money. No, we don't care about money. We want work. Laurent is fighting for the fundamental right to have rights, including the right to work, for the right not to be treated as secondhand citizens. Laurent's symbolic act of self-immolation at the end of the film is not, I think, an expression of his despair at the failure of the strike. Rather, it expresses his despair at the failure of workers to remain united, despite the show of solidarity by workers at another French factory and also by workers in England. Many of the workers see their struggle in merely financial terms. Having internalized the logic of neoliberalism, they fight for a bigger paycheck or severance package, and they see their relation to other workers not in terms of a shared past. Sorry, I have one paragraph, values and goals, but in economic terms. In The Measure of a Man, the depressing scenes dramatizing the extension of the economic logic of neoliberalism to social and work relations alternate with intimate family scenes in which Thierry is seen preparing dinner, dancing with his wife, taking care of his disabled son. These scenes, which are almost silent, recall Peter Fleming's argument about silence as refusal, the refusal of language, which has been invaded by market logic. The absence of such intimate scenes of care from at war points to a failure to imagine an alternative to the cutthroat logic of neoliberalism. For a while, convivial scenes of workers um, drinking or celebrating together suggest the possibility of such an alternative realm of care and solidarity, 
but eventually even this realm is invaded by market logic, splitting the workers into factions. At one point in the film, the union rep argues that although the state might not be all powerful, it has a moral right to side with the workers. It's a matter of social dialogue, which takes place outside the justice system. What authority or law, the film asks, dictates the resolution of such conflicts? Is it the unwritten law of the Kantian imperative, which describes how things ought to be, or is it the justice system, which describes how things are? Hauser's response is clear. He dismisses the workers' demands as fantasy or utopia, preferring instead to, quote, live in this world and follow the rules of this world, not the utopian one you imagine. Thank you. Oh. Uh, here I have a, a filmography, but it's very long. But just for reference. Um, Sorry, there is. Should I stop sharing my screen? I, I can't hear you. I cannot yeah. hear, I I hear you. So I cannot hear you. Hold on. Uh, so we have time for questions. I cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I cannot hear you. Okay. I heard what you said. You said we have some time for questions. Thank you, Connor, because I don't know what's happened. Your audio is, is not very good. Uh, yeah, your audio is not extra With a lot of content, with a lot Cinema uh, okay. So we can't, we can't, we can't hear uh, most of what you say. But, um, oh. Thank, I'll say uh, thank you for the interesting um, talk, and it was, uh, yeah, I found it, um, yeah, very interesting and challenging. Um, curious if they're uh, organizing. Kind of goal um, to this work is it uh, to make a moral argument, a political argument, or is it just analysis? Um, what's your in in your field, your objective? Because it seems like some of it is uh, kind of political and moral um, in time, terms of like a, the framing of it. But I was unsure if it's more just an analysis of uh, the cinema being produced. So I don't know if that's well, a it's, uh, very conscient question. <laughs> oh, no, it's not vague. Well, it's kind of a very broad question because um, not surprisingly in the past, I've, I have been asked similar questions and I don't really know how to respond because I'm in the humanities and there is a big difference between coming from the sciences where people always have like a question like, what is the purpose of this? Uh, what are you trying to say? And in the humanities, I'm generalizing of course, but uh, in the humanities, we don't sit down to write an article or write a book with a kind of a prescriptive sense, like this is how films should be made or um, the message of the film is so and so because we don't think of films as messages. So, but on the other hand, I don't want to say that this is just a mere analysis of the films. Obviously, I'm, uh, I don't have to say outright that, you know, this is my political position, this is my moral position. You can kind of, you yourself said that it seemed to you that I am making some sort of a political analysis and moral analysis, even though I'm not saying outrightly that it is such. But uh, yeah, so all I have to say is that um, I guess it's a, uh, I'm not uh, making an outright argument and intentionally so, because I don't consider that that's my, uh, I'm not a political analyst. I'm not a moral philosopher. I'm a film studies person. Yeah, and then, and then I guess they really decide 